incredible rob bartlett with us so if you aren't super aware of him we're gonna play a little video clip do you have any hobbies i've a hobby i play gin with mr brad and do you play it nicely play it nicely still he blitzes me in every game like that why because i play it the company way Executive policy is by me okay. How can you get anywhere? Junior, have no fear. Whoever the company fires, I will still be here. You will still be here. Year after year after fiscal, never take a risk all year. <laughs> so enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, this is great. Yeah, great to, it's really great to be here. Uh, uh huh. Uh huh. It's really, you know. Yeah, no, you <laughs> don't hold back. Let it all out. Uh, I can was, feel the energy. It was either this or getting my gum scraped, and uh, I flipped a coin mm -hmm. and I lost. Um, we, can, we can still do the gum scraping. <laughs> I, oh, okay. I, yeah. Uh, that's a I'm perk. right around the corner from That's you. a perk. You do Letterman, you get a fruit basket. We do the Pavaromo show, you get your gum scraped. That seems <laughs> yes. like a good deal. <laughs> Dental hygiene is very important. That's what we, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's his name on Price is Right? Said spay and new your animals. I say get your gum scraped. There you go. That's how I work my, <laughs> that's how I work my magic. You, <laughs> just, you should spay and neuter your guests. See, that would be... <laughs> That would be you the get, gift that keeps on giving. You actually get canceled for that now, so I can't do that anymore. Oh, okay. I wanted to do that, but it's a real problem now. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what do you? What is the? What's the yellow poster you have behind you on the wall? Uh it's a Beatles poster. It's a Beatles. Oh. Um, just below a, a photo from the Ed Sullivan Show. Nice. It's the Beatles Shea Stadium poster. Holy shit, dude! Oh, wow. Is that? That's fucking amazing, man. Yeah. I love it. You got the cheap trick on. Is it? It's cheap trick day. Happy cheap trick day oh. to you all. That's phenomenal. I didn't even know there was a cheap trick day. Every April 1st. Really? Yes. Rick Nielsen wow. uh, actually got a, an act of oh. happen uh, in Rockford. So, uh, yeah, every uh, every April 1st is uh, International Cheap Trick Day. So, Wow. You, you know, know, it's crazy. You, it was you also cut Pancake out during... Day or something. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> it's, it's not bad. It's April Fool's Day, Pancake Day, and Cheap Trick Day. You know what's great what? is that you, you cut out during explaining why it's Cheap Trick Day. So like all of that blacked out, and then you went, and that's why it's a cheap trick day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm sure Rick would approve. <laughs> and it remains a mystery as always. Yes. Oh, that's phenomenal. So I can't. I I don't. I, I seriously, we we met doing that charity thing that we did, the giant telethon, and you were just the best. It was. Dude. It was. You know, it was to my benefit that I was doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and uh, every time I got bored, I figured, oh, well, I'm going to log in and bust Richie Burns balls for an oh. hour or so. And by the way, we're very excited because Sunday, mm -hmm. Richie Byrne um, can actually, you know, he he can go back to being his normal self because apparently he gave up being funny for Lent. So, um, <laughs> Man, how long does Lent last? It's, uh, I don't know. I thought it was only 40 days, not 40, 40 days years. 40 days and 49. Well, see, that's the joke. The joke is he's always given it up. Yes. Um, how, how pissed off is he going to be that I'm breaking his balls even when it's not his show? I mean, oh, my God. What it, just whatever you do, don't mention Dr. Oz. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a sore sore subject. Yeah, I can understand why. <laughs> oh fuck, dude! I that's, feel like I, okay. oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna say no, I no, feel no, like it's so crazy. When You're the fucking today. engineer. Shut the fuck up. 
You know, I hate this when the when the <laughs> when the people behind the scenes decide they're the talent. It's like you don't see the cameraman pipe up during a fucking Jimmy Fallon interview. Just shut the fuck up and press the buttons and do what you're supposed to do. Jesus, Palomino. <laughs> Oh God! Oh, that's great. Oh, oh my shit. goodness! Beautiful. Still you one saying? of my favorites. Oh man! <laughs> so every time we went to go do the promo for the two people today, I mm-hmm. feel like nobody believed us that these guests were coming on. Yeah, because no. it's April Fool's Day. So we'd put it out there and be like, "No, I don't believe you. We're not going to go cross over to Twitch." Oh, that's yeah. funny. That's very mm-hmm. funny. Yeah, I yep, can understand them anyway. not, not believing Tommy Chong, but you know what the fuck have I been doing for the past year? <laughs> Um, <laughs> getting to know me that that's the craziest thing man I, out of that entire thing i did not like it, this was a uh an awesome uh a treat to just be able to be talking to you the entire time after because we messaged each other almost right away after it ended yeah because i mean there was something about you that i found you know relatively amusing which um <laughs> and which, now we're dating which could not be said you know for a lot of the other guests who are on the show um but i um you know i have a warm spot in my heart for you and, and silky silky really made me laugh just because he's a you know he's a night he's a madman and yeah. um and you know a couple of the other guys i mean it was just it was nice because i i'm so unplugged from from the scene Mm-hmm. what you kids call the scene right, right. um <laughs> that to see you know and, and my only exposure to it is i'm in the car listening to to the comedy channel on xm and i mm-hmm. can literally drive a hundred miles and not realize there's been 20 comics because they sound yeah. exactly the same they all have the same point of view they have the same delivery you know it's it's like the the, the mad libs it's so like just plug in a different name you know mm. but a couple of you guys stood out and you were definitely one of them. And I think part of that is because I think you writing your manifesto during the day <laughs> informs how you are funny at night, uh-huh. you know? Yes. Yeah. I have to take time off from that to make some jokes. <laughs> the longer my hair gets, the longer the manifesto is. I think that's the rule, right? I think so. I, I yeah. think so. Yeah. The longer I go without a hair, it's a good one, man. I'm going to have you proofread it. Okay, good. I, I mean, I was an English major, so you're lucky. I, and I just bought Grammarly, so I'm I'm good to go. Dude, that fucking thing installed itself on my computer. I didn't even know how it did it, but it like now will not stop correcting the wrong shit. By the way, like because you know how people type when they're typing quickly, uh-huh. so it's like you know we all have our own language and lingo and shit now on the internet. <laughs> it's literally like every other word. I'm like, ah! like it's taking me longer to message somebody now. I just want a, a program that will only correct when people use Y O U R for Y O U apostrophe R E. Your yeah. great is not Y O U R. It's Y O U apostrophe fucking R E. And it just that's one of my pet peeves. You know that and people who spell potatoes plural without the E. It's like <laughs> I literally I've I've taken. I've shaken. This is this is how my life has degenerated from the, the, the great prospect that I once had as a young man. I, I take I take a sharpie with me to the stop and shop, and I put a fucking e on potatoes on the sign just to try and you know give the pinheads, the mouth breathers who were working there a little grammar lesson, a little spelling oh, lesson. I like how that's how you know where you've been. I can literally track you by your just correcting people's grammar and stopping yeah. shops and shit yeah. all over the country. Yeah. So we, speaking of speaking of your youth, dude, this is when this is how what how what year was this? How long ago was this? I think that's eighty or eighty one, um, if I'm not mistaken. It's East Side Comedy Club. Right. Um, Jackie was on the show. He was emceeing, I guess. Um, I don't know whether I was on the bill or not. I don't know if Eddie was on the bill or not, but. Um, we used to go even when we weren't booked to fuck with the other comics just because it was a place to hang. And it was a, it was a real playground, you know I mean? And everyone just loved working with everybody else. And, and uh, I used to do the, I used to do two characters that would interrupt comics when they were on stage. One was this Italian film director who that guy was there. And right. uh, the other one was Herb Dexter, who was the plumber. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I got a picture of that somewhere with Hiram Caston where I got a plunger out of the bathroom and I had a hat and a jacket and I used God, to I roll my, 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 uh, my, my pants up above my knee, you know, and I, did, oh, I just want to let you know, somebody obviously had Mexican tonight. And so, uh, <laughs> you want to keep it just to the number one. Okay. In the ladies room, because Jesus got on a bicycle. I don't know whether or not, you know, I'm, I'm Herb Dexter. 
um, number one in the number two business. And um, <laughs> and I was just, you know, messing around. But this was an Italian film director. And then all of a sudden, Eddie comes out of the kitchen mm -hmm. with the, with the uh, apron on, and he's got a plate. And he's the, <laughs> he said he was the uh, the dishwasher, and he was pissed off because the people kept putting their cigarettes out in the plate. And he, he knew each and every plate by name. This is wow. Edgar, man. This is Edgar. <laughs> and somebody stubbed a cigarette out on Edgar, man. Don't worry, Edgar. I got your back. He was talking to the plate. It was just fucking genius. Wow. And we, you know, it was what we used to do. We just used to improv all the time back and forth because, I mean, the identical triplets, that's what we used to do. We'd do a little bit of our each, you know, Bob Nelson, Eddie, myself would do little bits of our own separate acts and then we would do these little prepared sketch things and we just launch us into just doing whatever just you know nelson would pretend that he was a uh, scuba diver and then eddie and i would just jump in and then we would just go with it and right you know there was a connection there and we kind of knew how each one thought and and it was it was i i look most fondly on those days for that reason because it was just you know it was just so much fun i used to heckle joey cola <laughs> Oh, and Joey Cole is a sweetheart too, so that must oh, have been great. What was great was that he would go right along with it. You know, right. I, was a, I was a drunk guy named Leon, and I would say, <laughs> "Yeah, very funny, Joey, um, Pepsi Cola." I, 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 did you drive here? Yes, I did, sir. I have a brand new Honda Quaalude. It does. It doesn't get uh, much mileage, but um, am I relaxed when I drive? I mean, it was, just, <laughs> and then he would just toss it back to me, and we would do twenty minutes in the middle of a set. Wow. Just, and the audience knew that this was something, you know, right. it was not expected, and it was very exciting. I mean, it was you can't, you know, you couldn't do that now. You know, no, I was just going to say, I feel like the club owners, even then, I mean, club owners are always, you know, uh, a comedian's enemy to a certain extent, but I feel like even now they don't let you play the way yeah. that you guys got to play back in the day. Well, it's a different business. You know mm -hmm. I mean? That, I mean, the East side was the first room where we actually started making money and it right. was opened and run by one of us, one of the magnificent yeah. seven who started at Dixon's Richie Minervini. And so, you know, we were friends with the owner, and he, to his credit, he knew that this was lightning in a bottle, you know, and right. he just let it happen. So, and now yeah. comedy clubs are like, uh, excuse me, we're trying to run a restaurant here. Right. Uh, and it's just, <laughs> and it's very regimented, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, 15 off, 15 off, 15 off, giving the light at, you know, 11. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, very different business. You know, you, Did you were you, how, were you, at, were you out in LA at all for very long or, or was I, it? I went out to LA for pilot season a couple times. I went out to do a couple pilots. Mm -hmm. um, I never really wanted to move to LA mm. because I, I didn't. I wasn't a fan of it. I mean, yeah. I liked. I liked you know, uh, staying uh, on Hollywood Boulevard, and I loved going to Grandma's Chinese Theater to see movies. Aside from that, it was very very difficult to get away from the business, <laughs> and I think. Yeah, to to stay sane, you got it. You got to have a little bit of a respite from it, you know. I agree. And and so I would go out there when I had work, you know. So yeah. Somebody actually said, I can't remember who it was. This is you go out to L.A. when there's a limo waiting to pick you up at the airport. Yes, and you know, and that's not a bad way of approaching it, you know, because mm -hmm. the idea of having to start at the bottom again and then work my way up was not right. really something that made sense to me, you know, and and. To be honest with you, it kind of worked out for me because I was able to main, maintain a family life, you know, and, and yeah. raise raise three kids and and actually do stuff here that I couldn't have done if I was out there. You know, I got got to do IMS, I got to do Broadway, I got to do the TV that shoots here in New York. So, you know, so it right. was it was. I don't have any regrets for not you know making the. Making the move <laughs> yeah no i don't but i mean i I lived in la for two years and i hated it uh i yeah i didn't hate it but it it would it sucked the the life out of me when um anytime there was any downtime it felt like you weren't working yeah even yeah. when you even when you just gotten done doing whatever it was downtime in la means you're out of work yeah and yeah, it's I not mean. and it's a really psychological kind of fucked upness or whatever but i do like going out there when i have something to do and yeah, then of course. Getting it done and then getting to leave and come back. I mean, like, and then being tan from being in LA. Yeah. You know, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. like having, having done something, you're like, hey, I was just in LA. People love right. hearing that for right. some reason. Right. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, I was just in LA. Oh, cool. Like, they assume that you, you know, did something amazing. And I'm like, really? I was, two yeah, I was on the coast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Rhode Island. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. And then, so, so would you, um, so you stayed primarily you were in New York because you did Broadway a lot. 
I was asking because like uh, when I went to the comedy store, you know, Carla above and Al- Alan Steven, right? Sure. Yeah, they the kind of improv you're talking about when I was out in L.A., I kind of only got to see a little bit of that from them at the comedy store because mm-hmm. uh, they did a little bit of that. But that's it. I don't get to see a lot of the improv and goofing around and stuff and, and comics really enjoying, you know, uh, themselves on stage, just doing whatever they want. Serious people, serious improv actors mm. would be aghast at what we do or what yeah, we did. Com- yeah. Because it was just so not, you know, any of the rule. There were no rule. You know, it wasn't sure. yes and. It was like whatever the fuck you wanted to say. Right. And then the other guys had to scramble to try and make it work. And, yeah. you know, it was that working without a net that, you know, that danger that comedians always like to tread that line, you know, yeah. um, that we always, you know, we're always teasing ourselves. How far can we go before we fall? And, and mm-hmm. that whole thing was very exhilarating. And it also had to do with the fact that the, there was chemistry, you yeah. know, and, and there was such a great camaraderie amongst the group that I started with. And that, you know, 20, 30 guys who were, who made up what I would call the, the cadre of who were, the comics and then some of the guys were from the city and some of them from the island and you yeah. know and man but there was a there was a, a mutual trust because we'd been in the trenches together you know we had mm-hmm. done nightmare gigs like the smithtown landing country club you know where they <laughs> they decided they were going to have a comedy night and they did they had they, had, they knew they had to have a microphone and an amp but they didn't realize that mm-hmm. they needed to stand and so they wound up yeah. taking a pool cue and duct taping the microphone <clears throat> to the pool cue and sticking it in an umbrella stand, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dave Hawthorne who was one of the guys we started with Dave Hawthorne, who had been in a, in a group with uh, Billy Crystal back in the seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, he went up to the microphone and he started doing this. With, the bottle will be ready in about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and then we hit a titty bar on the way back. So yeah. You know, and we Can't made be that. The, yeah, we, we, we made this kind of a philosophical discovery that we had a lot in common with strippers and that we would do anything for money <laughs> and we were both essentially naked on stage. So, <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah, the, the fucking road gigs with comics is always interesting because you never know what you're going to get. I did a, I did a college uh, when I was doing colleges with a friend and we literally got to it and they didn't have a mic stand or a mic. They had a, a podium commencement speech so we just did stand up we j- we just dicked around the entire time we pretended to do our act as if we were giving a commencement speech the entire time oh, and yeah. then they were like why are they doing that and I'm like well why don't you give me a fucking real microphone <laughs> you know? I, I, i've had a podium once or twice and uh here's what you do when you have the podium you get up at the po- oh jesus oh <laughs> nice <laughs> there you, you get go up the, you get up at the podium and you say uh hi i'm rob i'm an alcohol oh i'm sorry wrong meeting and then <laughs> Then it happens, baby. Yep. Then it happens. <laughs> then the magic starts. Of course, the college kids have no idea what you're referring to, but right, of course, no, not yet. Uh, so then there. So the, I'm just trying to get a timeline here, though, too. So you were out in Eastville Comedy Club, and then when did you start getting into like the acting thing, or was that always like a passion of your? Like, was that well, first, or did stand up come first? In high school, as you can plainly see there, in right? My, that's you in high school, yeah. In, in 1972, with <laughs> my my really cool pink striped jeans and. <laughs> <laughs> big ass big boy belt buckle um, you ran an ice cream shop back then too right oh uh, yeah it looked like yeah it. um i got i got the lead in barefoot in the park my first year oh, in high school great Southmore. play and great movie. Uh, it was that, that that was it you know once I, I knew that that's what i wanted to do right um and then when i went to school for english and theater went to college for english and theater and i left after my sophomore year because i had uh I have Crohn's, Crohn's disease, and I had oh, lost shit. a couple of weeks um, of class. And like an asshole, I didn't, I didn't inform my advisor, and so I didn't get any special dispensation. So they, they took my scholarship away from me because I didn't make the GPA. You know, apparently you need more than a, a one point four to maintain a scholarship <laughs> in, in college. And um, uh, who knew? Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I took a, a year leave of absence, ostensibly to to make enough money to go back. But while during that year, I was working uh, as a janitor in a office building in, in Manhattan that my uncle was the building superintendent for. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a guy who I worked with, another young guy, Igor Mucha was his name. And I would do impressions wow. and I would make fun of the guys we worked with and some of the people who, you know, in some of the offices in the building. And it was just like, just trying to make him laugh every day. And he said, you know, I have a friend who has a, a wine and cheese cafe near Hofstra. Uh, you should try and do some stand-up. And I didn't have an act. Wow. And I just figured, what the hell? And I went and I got up and I did it. And then that was it. It was Wow. And a, a year 
it came time to like shit. I got off the pot to go back to school. Right. I already was starting to make a little bit of headway doing stand up, and then about six months after that, I was making a living at it. So I never went back. Well, That's which, incredible. Which I you know I wish I had. Uh, really? Stayed. Well, I think I'd be smarter. You know, <laughs> and and, I'm, and I might have had a plan B. <laughs> but um, you, what do you need a plan B for? You're on broad. I mean, the, the, your well, career is like. It's funny. It's the the shit that happens to you in a career. It, yeah, a lot of it is just making yourself available. I remember right. reading um, uh, an interview with Steve Martin in Rolling Stone, and and the quote that has always stuck with me was he had said, "You know, when the bus shows up, make sure your bags are packed." Right. And as long as your bags are packed, then it's just like you got to kind of open yourself up to the universe and say, "Whatever, I'm game." Yeah, you know, and, and and be willing to do whatever, you know. Right. And um, I kind of fell into doing Broadway, kind of in a really strange, backwards way. You know, I mean, I was always under the impression that the people who were on Broadway were so much different than me. They were mm -hmm. so much better than me. There was like this: I could never be on Broadway. I wasn't the, you know, I didn't go to you know acting school. I didn't. I mean, I took acting class, but I didn't go to you know Juilliard. like uh, Juilliard or anything like that. And and right. um. I was in in Vegas. I was doing I was doing the Sands. I was one of the last acts at the Sands before they blew it up. Wow. Um, I was yeah. on the very same stage as the uh, as the Rat Pack had been. Yeah, uh, they put me up in this shag carpet suite in the bungalows <laughs> in the back, which apparently had been JFK's suite. Oh so my God! Every man. night I kept looking to see if there was any, you know, Marilyn Monroe's bras or anything laying around. Yeah, the, and, the fucking <laughs> DNA on that rug alone, man. Oh please, please. <laughs> it was the kind of rug that you definitely had to wear socks before you walked on it, you know, and, and then burn the socks afterward. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and there was a guy, it was a, a theater uh, producer who had done, uh, produced damn Yankees on Broadway with uh, Jerry Lewis and uh, owned a couple of off Broadway theaters. And he came to see the show. Uh, I don't know. If, I think he heard me on I miss and um he called my manager Gary and said, "You know, we're, we'd like to to put Rob in a in a, in a theater." And so, you know, it originally was going to be an off Broadway theater because he owned, um, I think, the Orpheum he owned at the time. Uh, that's where Stop used to be in 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 the city. And oh, wow. he, he was going to just his quote was, "We're going to just put the spotlight on the fat guy." And so <laughs> Gary and I were talking, and 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 Gary said, "You know, it'd be really great if you did something that was a little." bit more developed than just your act mm -hmm. so i sat down and I, I wrote this framework around my act um i was very very uh, influenced by jonathan winters jonathan winters was one oh, of my yeah. heroes the funniest people on the planet you know and mm -hmm. i uh he had Did this thing i think it was him? on no unfortunately but he uh, uh he used to do this thing he had a show where they had an attic and they just put all this shit in an attic, like shit that you would find in an attic. And he would mm -hmm. just walk around and pick up stuff and then do five minutes with whatever he picked up. So I thought, wow. well, that would be a good, so it was a garage because it was Long Island. And I wrote this thin framework of a story about this box that I was avoiding. I was cleaning out the garage and the box was sent by apparently somebody who was in the same trailer park that my father, my estranged father lived in. And so they sent it to me because I was his, you know, I hadn't seen him in 30 years and, you know, it was a little maudlin. You know, it was a little too <laughs> sentimental. And um, and I just, you know, I did my act based on all this stuff. And uh, we did it uh, up in Connecticut at the Rich Forum Theater. It was called Have a Nice Life. And it got mixed reviews. Um, one, one, one negative and one, this kind of sucks. And then, <laughs> um, and then an, a Broadway theater opened up. And oh, they wow. decided, well, we're going to stick him on Broadway. And so I would shed it that summer with another director, Jack O'Brien, who mm -hmm. directed Hairspray and directed uh, yeah. Adam's Family and directed Willy Wonka and directed all these. Uh, maybe he didn't do Adam's Family, but he did Willy Wonka and uh, and um, uh, the the Full Monty, I mean, well respected uh, yeah. Broadway director. And we kind of worked together and would shed at this thing. And it was we adapted it. It was a little, it was a lot better than the version we had done in Connecticut. Okay. Yeah. Dana Reeve, Christopher Reeve's wife, to play my wife, and 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 wow. um, uh, Joyce Van Patten to play my agent. Those are the other two characters in the show, and we opened at the Eugene O'Neill Theater in October of 1998. Holy and shit. and the wow. pull quote from the Times was "Avert your eyes." <laughs> wow. And, 
it's not something that you put up on the marquee to sell tickets. You know? um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there was, I think one of one of the reviews said some of it. It's a colossal waste of time, and said, "So why don't we just put colossal exclamation point in your post?" <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we had 16 previews, four performances. We opened um, on a Friday and we closed on a Sunday, and, wow. um, or Saturday. I think we closed. We opened no. Thursday. We opened Thursday. We closed on Saturday after the second show. Oh trip. shit! And, oh, um, wow. Fuck and them. I, I went into a tailspin because I I didn't book any work for like a year, thinking I was going to be working. Right. And, of um, course. It took a while to kind of get back into the swing of things, but then um, I did this thing. They they do. It's called City Center Encores. Mm -hmm. uh, what they do is uh, these guys put together these shows, these Broadway musicals that have never been revived and usually for good reason, but sometimes they pick something that's really decent. Chicago actually came out of that because Chicago had never been um, re redone because the original Chicago um, apparently was not a great success, even though it was Gwen Verdon and Cheetah Rivera. Um, mm -hmm. they were up against like a chorus line. And so there was, everything was a chorus line. You couldn't uh, do a chorus line. So, um, there was a, a show called golden boy, which had been a musical with Sammy Davis jr. Back in the fifties, I think, or, or mm -hmm. yeah, fifties. And, um, this casting agent, um, Jay Bender, who, who knew me from Imus and who used to send me out on commercial auditions and was a huge fan. He said to Walter Bobby, you should take a look at Rob Barlin. And so I went and I, I had no audition materials. I sang Till There Was You because that was my wedding song. And um, oh, wow. I got a call. Yeah, it, it, I got this small part as one of the boxers managers, Roxy. And uh, you you get cast on a Monday. You go into rehearsal on Tuesday. And then you open uh, the Thursday following the following week. And you do four performances Okay. Uh, so it's like being shot out of a cannon. You do a full musical. You know, right. you still you still have your script and everything, um, because tech, there's some equity thing that you can't do a full blown. But you know, mm -hmm. since then they've been doing full blown productions. And right. Walter Bobby was the guy who directed Golden Boy. And so after that, I had done uh, uh, another casting agent, Jerry Beaver, thought I was perfect for this off Broadway show called Tabletop. And Tabletop was this, um, I think it was a 100-minute real-time mm -hmm. um, slice of life from a, a commercial shoot. Okay. Uh, but it was the product shots of the commercial. It wasn't the actors. It was, you know, um, the beer pouring into the glass or the, you know, the, the, the pizza being pulled with the cheese. Um, yeah. But this was for some kind of a fruit freeze drink. And there was a pile of fruit and a freeze thing. And I played this tyrannical director who needed to get this shot because the, the competition was starting to steal my thunder and starting to steal my clients. And right. I came in on a, on a Saturday because we couldn't get the shot. And, and so the whole thing is like, boom, 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 boom. And we <laughs> opened off Broadway and, um, it, it took a lot of convincing the director mm -hmm. to get me to play the part. But the guy who wrote the play said that I was so much like the guy it was based on because he had worked as a prop guy when it's commercial shoots um, wow. that he, he, he won and I got to do it and, and won a fucking drama desk award to play this cocksucker of a, of a TV director, you know, commercial oh, director. Yeah. And then uh, again, the way shit happens. I'm having lunch with Joyce Van Patten, the, you know? Um, yeah. And we're uh, we're in the in the, the the there's a cafe above the fairway in Manhattan. We're sitting. I'm having a burger and fries, and Walter Bobby is sitting in the corner. Wow. And Joyce waves, and he waves her. He, she'd work with him. Waves yeah. us over. He remembered me. We sat down. We started chatting. We had lunch with Walter Bobby. Following week, my manager Gary gets this call. Um, Walter would like Rob to come in and, and audition for Amos Hart in Chicago. Holy shit. And, you know, I'd seen Chicago and Amos is like, you know, Mr. Cellophane. Yeah. Is the single greatest character part in Broadway history. The bat, yeah. I don't give a shit what anybody says. It's just, you have three scenes in the first act, three scenes in the second act. You have the show stealing number in the second yeah. act. It's, it's the greatest, it's the greatest part ever. Mm -hmm. And so I go in for a Wednesday matinee and uh, he said, you know, uh, have Rob get in touch with Bob Billy, who was the musical director. The band is on stage for this production. Mm -hmm. And that had been, uh, th that's how they used to do do the shows right. at, at City Center Encores, was the band is on stage. So it's because it's supposed to be an in-concert kind of thing. But that whole minimal, minimalistic production kind of got to be the, you know, 
the hallmark of why it won so many Tonys because it was just, you know, fucking brilliant. Right. And so I see the matinee and um, I don't really know what to do. And, and uh, I'm, I'm the crowd leaves and I'm sitting in the audience and the curtain goes up and Bob Billig is the musical director, the guy who conducted the show. So he goes, Rob, I said, yeah. I said, come on up. So I go up on stage <laughs> and he sits at the piano and he says, uh, do you know cellophane? I said, yeah. And he said, oh, let's go. And I sang cellophane. He thanked me. I got, you know, got back in the car and started to drive home. And I was about to get on the Triborough Bridge. And I got a phone call from Gary. And he said, uh, you're going to Broadway, kid. Oh, and my God. That was it. I mean, I was in that show for a year and a half and then back and forth a few times. And then I got Mushnick in Little Shop, the Broadway original Broadway production of Little Shop. Yeah. And that led to The Odd Couple with Nathan and Matthew. And that led to Sweet Charity with Christina Applegate. That must have been a, uh, I, I wish I'd gotten to see that, man. That was a, what What year was The Odd Couple with, uh, because that was before they did. Um, it was the after producers. the producers. No, it was, it was after, after the, producers. the producers. That was the thing, is they thought magic was going to strike twice again. They thought right. that magic was going to start, you know, strike twice. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> the the um, the critic from the Times, I guess, had it in for Nathan, and oh. just tore the show apart. Why? Because he and was playing the uh, the um, you know the the slob. I I don't know what you know whatever it was. Mm -hmm. The guy was an asshole. I got back at him because he he really savaged Dan Radcliffe in the review of How to Succeed. So right. I got um, I got urinal cakes. Uh, made up with his picture on them and put them <laughs> in all the bathrooms in the theater, including the ones in the lobby. Um, oh, fuck. to get back at him. So, uh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, I'm not mentioning his name because it's not worth it. No, um, I hear you. you. You can look it up though, guys. Yeah. He was a douche nozzle. And, um, <laughs> and then, you know, that then was, you know, how to succeed. It's just, uh, it just, yeah, you know, something no leads bold. to another. It's the way it happens in this business. Something leads to something else. You, you work with somebody who likes you. You know, you, if you do your best to not be an asshole when you're working anywhere, then people want to work with you or they want to have you back. You know, agreed. You know, it's don't trash the condo, and maybe you'll get yeah. to go back to Richmond. You yeah, know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Being nice goes a long way too. People yeah. don't believe it, but it totally fucking does. Because if even if even if you're like a mediocre talent, I feel like. People, if you're just nice to be around, like most of the time, like you're going for auditions and stuff, they're just like, do I want to spend six months on a set with this fucking guy? Oh, yeah. like that's that's basically it. Like even it like uh, rather than, you know, as long as you're you're putting asses in seats, as yeah. long as you're, you know, you're good box office, they'll tolerate that behavior. Right. The, right. the minute that shit stops, mm -hmm. you know, you're. You know, it's, right. it's like that axiom. It's like uh, a show business career. It's uh, who's Bartlett, and then it's get Rob Bartlett, and then it's get me a young Rob Bartlett, and then it's get me a Rob <laughs> Bartlett type, and then it's who's Rob Bartlett. So that's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know what's crazy? When you said get me a young Rob Bartlett, I immediately thought Jonah Hill. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you, oh, Pablo. I think I got it. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, Jonah Hill. <laughs> he's a great, great man. He's a great improviser. And, you he's know, a funny. great improviser, but he's got curly hair and he's Jewish. Even though, <laughs> as an Irish Catholic, I get more calls to play Jewish guys. I don't know what it is. I'm like the... Uh, the Morty Gunty for, for our time or something. I don't know what it is. But, I mean, it's like Dude. when I first got the call for SVU, it was like, you're going to play Milton Schoenfeld. Okay. <laughs> and then it was with, uh, with uh, the good wife. So you're going to play Bernie Bukovitz. <laughs> uh, but then I got to break the mold in elementary. It was like, you're going to be Captain Dwyer. So, okay, I get to be the Irish cop. Captain, oh, so. finally. That's, yeah. but that's, but that's the role you want when you're being anything Irish. Oh, man. I, I, I had always wanted to – I got into this business to play a fucking cop. Yeah. And so uh, to, play, to play the actual, you know, captain yeah. of, uh, of the squad, you know, was just – it was the greatest, you know. That's phenomenal. Uh, what, did you get to hang out with Broderick and Nathan Lane and stuff like that when you were on Broadway and all those oh, guys? Yeah. I mean, you get, you know, you, when you're in a show, you live with these people, you know, six days a week, but eight shows. So you may right. as well be with them 24 seven. Right. And, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, you go through the whole re rehearsal period together mm -hmm. uh, in a musical, especially if it's you're not a replacement, if it's a new musical or or a new revival of a musical, they have something that's called a sits probe, which is the, the it's a sitting rehearsal. It's when you get to hear the whole score with the full orchestra and the whole cast, and you sing through the whole show, um, right. and so you share that moment together, which is just incredible i mean i've only mm. done it a couple of times i've done it for each one of the uh, city center encores thing i did and i did it for how to succeed and i did it for for little shop and it's just one of those things where you just you know the hair stands up in the back of your neck you know right um and you're in the trenches you know you're in the yeah. trenches with everybody and uh the best part about the odd couple was neil simon was in the room every single day at rehearsal oh shit wow. and that was just wow. one of the single greatest things that ever happened to me because you know, I cut my teeth on comic timing by doing Neil Simon shows like in high school and college. Are you saying the, uh, yeah, the, uh, so the actual, for the park, right. And to, you know, and, and to actually meet him, you know, it was like, you know, so yeah. I knew how to say his words, you know, I knew right. the rhythm. I knew the inflection. As a matter of fact, opening night, he sent me, see the opening night or closing night. He sent me this really very cool letter about how not everyone can, can speak his lines the way that they're intended, but I made it look easy and it was really, really simple. And I have that wow. and the fan letter I got from Sondheim for tabletop in a little frame that I put up in every dressing room I have ever been in. <laughs> Sondheim man. liked the cocksucker that I played apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's an honor. Um, but, but Neil actually, it, it was summer. We'd been we we were rehearsing, mm -hmm. rehearsing Odd Couple because we were going to open in October. So it was like, I guess it was end of July, beginning of August. And Neil said, "Can would you do me a favor?" I said, "Well, no, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> no." Um, he said, um, "Ernie Sabella, the guy who plays Herman in Sweet Charity, over mm -hmm. around the corner at the." Uh, I forget the name of the theater. It's uh, named after the guy who did the Broadway caricatures. I can't remember if I can. Oh, use it. um, fuck, Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld, the Hirschfeld yeah. Theater. Uh, Christina Applegate is playing Charity in Sweet Charity. Um, Ernie Sabella is leaving; has to leave for you know medical reasons um, for the summer, and we, we have Wayne Knight Newman from Seinfeld uh, oh, wow. coming in in September. We need a we need a guy to kind of fill in. Would you fill in? And yeah of course you know mm. so at the time we were doing i miss in the morning in secaucus because we were simulcast on msnbc and msnbc's studios were in secaucus mm -hmm. and so i live on long island and because there's no easy way of getting to secaucus from long island i would drive mm -hmm. and because we were on tv all the characters i did you know dr phil and you know brian wilson and all these yeah. different characters that i played you know, i'd have to be in the makeup chair <clears throat> by 4 30 because you know the show went on at six mm. so i had to leave my house at 3 30. so i leave my house at 3 30 i'd go to secaucus do the i'm a show and get out of costume and makeup and maybe have a little bite to eat and then drive into the city and then go start rehearsal like at, you know 11 o'clock in the city for the odd couple and then i was done rehearsal at five and then i would go and I'd get a little bite to eat, and I'd go to my dressing room at the at Hirschfeld, and I would do Sweet Charity. I'd get back in the car, I'd drive back to Long Island, I'd get home around 12, 1230. And I had to be back in the car at 330. I did that for the entire summer. And wow. uh, if that didn't kill me, nothing will. I yeah. I couldn't even imagine doing it now. Um, yeah. But... Uh, and was, Ernie Sabella is the dude who did Pumbaa in Lion King, yeah. right? That's yeah, Ernie, okay. he's a great, make... great character actor and just yeah. a sweetheart of a guy. His brother um, was in the original cast of the Chicago um, oh. revival. He played, um, um, I, don't, I don't know, tell, he, he plays Mary Sunshine. You're not supposed to know. It's a guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> spoiler alert, because they didn't do it in the movie. They didn't do it in the movie. Right. But, yeah. um, they just cast Christine Baranski to play the part, so. Yeah. Well, wait, same thing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> see, see what I did there? I made the face and let you take the line. <laughs> I, I, you're very generous. I appreciate that. Salute. I like to drink wine more than I used to. <laughs> Cheers. I wanted to ask, how is your family with all of this? Are they super supportive? So I feel like that's got to be tough for the wife and family at home when you're. It is. It, it really is. And, and to my, you know, my benefit and, 
a very, very understanding wife. And, uh, and she mm. kind of enjoyed the fact that I wasn't up her ass, you know, as much. Yeah. Um, it was good that I wasn't around so much. I mean, but I tried, I tried to make them like I would take off, if, you know, for birthdays, I'd take off for graduations, I'd take off. And even when you had a, a spring concert or something, I would always take off. I mean, it just, even if I didn't have time coming, I would, you know, I would invent being sick or something just because there's no, there's no way I was going to miss any of that. Yeah. yeah. Good. Know, because, um, and I, I think they're no worse for the wear. I hope. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they're all harboring secret <laughs> well, we resentments. Have them on. <laughs> <laughs> so, boxes. Harboring secret resentments for all the times I wasn't there, but let's um, bring them out. No, I, I feel like that's another thing too, that like you need, like we were uh, some of the like guests that we've had on stuff like that. If we've asked, you know, about that kind of thing, they either had somebody who was there and who was supportive and that it seems like if you're performing and stuff like that, that is kind of what you need. Somebody who just acknowledges this is what the life's going to be like. Cause any, anything else, it's, it's not going to work. It's, it's an incredible sacrifice on their part. It really is. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, to be fair, you know, I'm making a living, Yeah. you know, but it's, you know, I'm making a living at something that I really, really love. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's funny because I, I was on the road um, after I'd gotten married. My, my, my wife has owned and, and taught at a, a dance studio since I know her. Uh, since I met her in 1980. And um, so she would have off summers. And so I would book, you know, eight weeks on the road and we would just travel on the road. You know, oh. It was kind of like a vacation. We would just travel around and, and right. do the shows and uh, sightsee during the day and whatnot. And and then we had our first child. We had our first son, Sean, um, brought him with us. You know, mm -hmm. I had a little porta crib and, you know, he, he was on the road with us and, and then he got older and he was going to start nursery school or pre-K. And, and uh, we had just gone to Disney World um, together. And I think we had both of our moms. We brought both of our moms down, too. So it was like the big family Disney World thing. And, you know, it was yeah. the first time Sean had ever been to Disney World. And, you know, the picture of me with it on my shoulder watching the parade. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah. And then I had to drive them to the airport and then go. Uh, I was doing a gig in somewhere not daytona beach but somewhere north northern florida i think mm -hmm. and i was sitting in the hotel room and i was apoplectic i just i could not stand the fact that i was away from my wife and my kid wow. and i called gary i said i can't do this anymore i can't do the road i really wow. can't do this anymore i just you know i i have to be close to my family mm. and so he figured out a way that I could four wall this club in Manhattan called club 1407. It was a lunch lunchtime club in the garment district that was closed on weekends. And so we got to go in and four wall it. And I did kind of a one man show with opening acts, you know, and, wow. you know, Foxworthy and Brett Butler and, yeah. And, um, you know, wow. I'm trying to think of Ray Romano. I had all these guys, you know, opening for me kind of fell into the Iverson in the morning show where I got to be a writer performer for 31 years so I could stay in town. And then I, that allowed me to, and to I miss his credit, you know, he was very supportive and encouraged me to, you know, do the Broadway stuff. Um, and so it all really kind of worked out, but it was, it was definitely motivated by the fact that I couldn't stand being away from my family. I was, I was in, I'll never forget. I was in a restaurant with the other two acts and we were having a bite to eat before the show. And I looked and there was a little kid about Sean's age in a, in a high chair at the table with his parents. And, um, one of the other comics uh, uh, on the show is a, a female comedian. She looked at me and she went, okay. And she could say, you know, oh, wow. and then, um, cause it was, it was that obvious. I mean, I'm just, I was miserable. I was yeah. miserable. Um, but you know, you know, as John Lennon says, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. <laughs> <laughs> it's Either true. that or it, he said that, and I'm sorry, Yoko, are you Japanese? Um, <laughs> those are the <laughs> right, major quotes. Right. Uh, <laughs> I have a poster of the latter one. It's pretty sweet. Uh, <laughs> nobody gets it, but uh, <laughs> they're like, why? I'm like, you'll understand. Um, yeah, it's crazy because that does seem like the life cycle. Like there's, there's different cycles of comedians and stuff like that, that they take. And it's either the progression that you had with it, where your career was going, you know, to a point where you're on the road and you'd had enough cause you had a family and then you wound up actually stabilizing yourself with I miss and then doing Broadway and stuff like that. So you got to stay local. And then there's the other part of it where you just do it till you're dead. 
at you know yeah. <laughs> like yeah. at like a ripe 50 you know like <laughs> and you know i've also seen a lot of guys who you know were my peers at the time and they would they would get a break to get a young comedian special whatever and right. there'd be a limo waiting for them out in la and they had a development deal and they bought a million dollar house and they did the pilot and the pilot didn't get picked up and now they're selling the million dollar house and they're going back so that they can middle at the club that they used to work oh, at you know so God. yeah i saw how that worked and right. i realized that the trade-off it just wasn't worth it you know it's so much different now, though, too. Like, I mean, everybody talks about it, but the just the special isn't special anymore. Oh. You know, uh, everybody's putting out their own shit. Either you're putting it out for free. Mm -hmm. People are trying to accumulate. Fo like, it, it is really like it's just such a fucking random thing now. And it's I, if I, I kind of find it exciting. And at the same time, I think it's fucking exhausting to a certain extent. Do you feel like I mean, you, I, I like you, you consider yourself. You said you haven't been like out there, but. I mean, you must feel a little bit of it, right? Like you see it all the time. I, you know, I think I got into show business because I didn't want to work for a living. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, not realizing that, you know, it, it takes a it pandemic. Takes, yeah. I mean, no, no. <laughs> it's a great, a great comic. Um, Bob Altman went by the name of Uncle Dirty. Oh, yeah. Uncle Dirty. And Uncle Dirty uh, was a very, very wise man. He had been a, a peer of Priors. I don't know anything prior and Carlin went on a Tonight Show once and they both referenced him when they were on the panel. Um, Uncle Dernie was like, you know, this guy who was just this icon and was just doing late night sets of the improv when I when I first met him. And he's, you know, he's a very, very, he'd seen it all. And I'll never forget one of the things that he said. He said, if you want the brain surgeon paycheck, you got to do the brain surgeon homework. <laughs> and that was like, you really got to fucking do the, you got to work. You yeah. got it. You got to do it. You got to not, you know, and the other thing is, is the, uh, I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt's quote. It's like, you know, the only, the only key to success is persistence. You just can't ever give up. Right. And it's, you know, which is easy to say, but when you're stand up, especially, you know, you're in it because you're looking for approval, you're seeking approval and, you know, we're either all wounded you know, doves because our, our fathers didn't give us the approval that we sought. You know, I sucked at sports and my father was a, a, a minor league baseball player. So, you know, that went pretty well. Um, <laughs> and so you put yourself in a position where you're looking for that approval every night. You yeah. force yourself into the situation where you're confronting this, you know, this lack that you have in your personality and, and, and you, and you do it every night. And, you know, it, it, it does fuck with a lot of people, you know, I mean, yeah. there are a lot, I, I know a lot of friends that I either lost to Coke or to suicide um, because they couldn't, they couldn't deal with that part of the business, you know, right. Um, you're, you're always on the wrong side. You know, it's like um, you're looking at them, you know, you're their time off is your on time. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you work when and it's their leisure time. It's just, it's, it's a different, yeah. It's a different world. And so to, you know, you, you, it's not, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. No, especially like people don't understand. Like I remember, you know, it's one of the weirdest things to me. And I remember thinking of it when I was starting out is like you bum, you know, it's hit and miss. And the nights when you're young and you're starting out and you bomb, you don't grab around the concept that it's one night. Like, it's like, oh, my God, 200 people just fucking hated me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's it's this excruciating, like the, the feeling you get in the back of your neck, the headache, mm -hmm. the fucking, you know, pressure and time stands. Five minutes is, you know, 10 hours. And <laughs> and then and then you go, I would I would that would happen to me. And then I would go and book five more gigs like a lunatic. <laughs> because I'd be like, I, I gotta get. I had a good night though the other night, so I'm gonna try and do it again. <laughs> your 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 head your head starts to sweat. You know, yeah. It's it's like that old joke. It's like the the comic who does two shows at Vegas and uh, uh, one show eh, doesn't do that great, and another show he kills. Mm -hmm. And this beautiful blonde goes to his dressing room and says, he opens the door. And she goes, I saw your show, and I just want to tell you, I I want to get naked right now, and I'll do anything that you want, anything that you want I'll do because I saw your show. And the comic goes, which one do you see? The first one or the second? <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true. You know, it's like, <laughs> but the, it is like the great thing about bombing, especially when you have like a tightly knit group, like the one that I came from that there's nothing better. 
no, for I another know. comic than to watch another comic, you know, eat the midget. You know, watch oh, yeah. Fight the bullet, you know. <laughs> and then they, like, it, it, it catch, you know. Yeah. Or, or the improv, which were like the they were like the depots from where everyone would gather to go out in their one nighters in Jersey and Connecticut or whatever, and then they'd come back and they'd come back late and they would see whoever was on late. Right. The catch nine times out of ten was Gilbert because they wanted to Ooh. get rid of the three drunks from New Jersey who wouldn't go home. <laughs> I once saw him do 45 minutes without opening his eyes, you know? <laughs> I went to Africa lately. I, it's all black there now. I mean, but we'd, be, we'd be in the back of this club and just hurting oh. ourselves, laughing so hard. And, Holy shit. And, and, you know, and... Yeah, but that was always the greatest, you know. To watch yeah. the comic. I, oh you god, know. that fucking got me. I worked with him. Fl- I, I I worked with him so many fucking times, and we literally had a text message at one point where uh we're, we were just texting each other at one show because it was a bad it was a bad room it was a bad show it was a comedy club in a hotel that kind of thing or whatever. And he went and he just sent me a text message that was just like they didn't even give me a, a high enough room to jump out of. I have, he's like, he's like, if I jump out of this window, I'm literally just escaping. <laughs> I like, I'm like dying before the show even starts. I know. And he would, I loved how he used to, he would barrel through a fucking set, no matter who was fucking left. La- I mean, it's, he's, he's hysteric. You know, it was just, it was magic. It's just magic, man. He, uh, he, one of the single funniest people I think I've ever known. Yeah. Uh, Fred a sweet man. Oh, sweet, oh, sweet man. Fred Stoller. And Fred yeah. Stoller, who's another sweet, sweet man. And I'll never forget the first time I met Fred. It was a one-nighter in Jersey and, you know, picked him up. And I think Carol Leifer was the other act on the show. And I had oh, the wow. car. So that was one of the reasons why I got the gig, because I could drive. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Fred, Fred's sitting in the car. And, you know, Fred's demeanor is very, very much like, you know, does he have skeletons of small animals underneath his porch? He's mm-hmm. got, you know, there's something not quite right. He goes, so, uh, so <laughs> Bartlett, um, you, you like comedy? <laughs> and I'm thinking, how is this guy going to do stand up? Like they're going to eat him alive, right? And I think I was emceeing, and I went up and I said, well, he's, you know, Fred Stoller, and he gets up, and, he's, and he, there's this silence in the room. It's painful because it's mm-hmm. like, he goes, um, my cousin, um, he committed suicide, <laughs> he hung himself in the backyard from a pole because nobody would play with him. (laughs) Now people play with him. And there was like this pause. Right. And then the crowd would start to let it go. I see we have some tetherball fans. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not married, but for this next joke, let's pretend I am. (laughs) My wife's name is Denise. When I have sex with my wife, Denise, she calls out other men's names. They answer her. <laughs> it's like, oh I was like, act was like that. You know, he's, he's, I was never very good at math, so when I die, I'm going to leave my body. I was never very good at science. I fucked up the joke. I was never very good at science, but when I die, so when I die I'm going to leave my my body to math when I fucked up. The, uh, <laughs> that that is like, it. That is it. Very much like, like Gilbert in that he had this this totally different way of, and and just a sweetheart. He Eddie and I were doing the Fort Lauderdale comic strip, and I think Eddie told this story on BTF to Mark Marin mm-hmm. um, during the day. You got nothing to do except go to the beach, go to the movies. We decided we we're going to rent jet skis, so mm-hmm. we go to this place where I, I saw near the condo we were standing where they rented jet skis and it was on the canal mm-hmm. you know and the canal of course is filled with gasoline it's not like the pure ocean it's a fucking oil slick but we rent <laughs> jet skis <laughs> none of us that have tried a jet ski before we just said fuck it we're renting jet skis right. so we get on them and we're spending more time falling off them and then it just circles you until you can <laughs> swim onto it and then get back up on it yeah. and uh, so and you know the the, the the, the motors are going, it's spitting out exhaust in your face, and you're trying to jet ski. Eddie and I are getting a hang of it, and we're kind of, you know, fucking with each other. And mm-hmm. Fred falls off and can't get back on. <laughs> and there are these boats that are kind of whizzing by us. Mm-hmm. And, and Freddie's going, people on the boat, people on the boat. 
don't don't run me over. I'm trying to get on the jet ski, but the fumes keep making me nauseous. He was explaining <laughs> to the people on the boat. Like, oh my god. Great. It's great. Oh great holy shit. Great, great memories. Yeah. Great oh memories. man. There's nothing better than being on the road with a bunch of comics you like. Oh, oh. It's and just, the shit you have to do when you're on the road too, like you've been jet skiing. I've gone rock climbing when I was, and I've never would want to do that. My, but when you're on the road, there's nothing to do in Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so you're like, hey, they got a rock climbing gym. Do you want to? I guess we have ten hours to kill. <laughs> here's something. Here's something you never see a comic on the road say to the other guys at the condo. Hey, uh, you guys want to go to a museum today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> my when I go out on the road, uh, my I travel with like one of my closest friends in comedy too, and just in general, her name is Joanne Filan. She's hilarious. So we'll go to we'll go to you know all these places together, or whatever. But we usually wind up hitting up like record, like old record store, like antique shops, because all these fucking weird towns that only have a movie theater and a yeah. comedy club have yeah. the best shit to sell. Yeah, people, you know, either they whatever it is, and uh, we went to one in Ohio, and uh, we oh, we thought we were gonna die. We was I don't know what we've been I've been to Ohio before it's not a bad area or whatever but there was one dude one white guy in there who literally did the typical we don't lock strangers in this town and I, and I was like I was like oh my god this guy's fucking hilarious he's actually and I started like, I'm like doing, I'm like oh my god he's doing a bit and then the store owner was like you need to get the fuck out of here <laughs> he's like he's not stable and I we were just like oh really no no because jo- my uh, Joanne Joanne's uh, gay so he's got these tattoos she got the short hair and I look like me like a terrorist Keebler elf, you know, with a leather jacket and shit and fucking, and we were like, I was like, oh, so we're not, well, we don't want to, okay, that's fine, fair enough. <laughs> we had to like fucking, we had to fucking leave the antique toy store we were in. <laughs> there were Grand Rapids, Michigan, there was a, a club in a hotel, which is always great because you only had to take an elevator to get to work. Um, <laughs> you didn't have to wait for the owner to pick you up or, or, right. or trust the opener who was some local guy who had this piece of shit car yep. and, and thought he had to be drunk in order to drive it um, to get to the club. <laughs> and so there it was only a, runs on me drunk. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so um, there was a warehouse in downtown Grand Rapids that I guess they had bought the inventory from like four or five tuxedo rental places. Mm -hmm. And so there was this huge warehouse with all these vintage fifties and sixties tuxedos. And I got um, the greatest like white tuxedo with the red plaid collar and the red cummerbund. I think I wore it at the uh, Jerry Cooney roast at at Eastside. Um, And it's like, and I got it. It was like 15 bucks or something like that. It was like, Oh, I got a purple velour tuxedo, which was just like the ultimate cheesy Vegas lounge act. So there were all these really, really great things that I'd never seen it before. And so every time I would go there, I'd get, you know, I get a couple of hundred bucks worth of these vintage tuxedos. And uh, somebody got wise from New York and bought a rented a tractor trailer and went in and bought the entire inventory oh, and then just brought them all the trash in vaudeville and made like eight hundred thousand dollars off of uh, oh, the shit. inventory. So that was that was a sad day that you couldn't uh, you couldn't get <laughs> vintage tuxedos anymore in Grand Rapids. Oh wow. my god, that's fucking crazy. What was that? Do you have a do you have a place that you love to go back to all the time? Like a like a solid. Like just uh, like a club or a, or a yeah. venue that you were just like, I cannot wait to go back there. The Fort Lauderdale comic strip was definitely one of them in the old days um, mm. because it was just a playground, you know, and, and you would work with all these great people, you know, uh, work with Seinfeld. You'd work with, right. um, you know, Larry Miller. You'd work with Paul Reiser and Ron Richards. And, wow. Um, you know, Eddie, Eddie and I did it a couple times together, which is a blast hanging out with him. Yeah. You know, we got the idea that we we're going to drive to Disney World one day. We we're going to get up at five <laughs> o'clock in the morning to drive to Disney World, go to Disney World. It was only the Magic Kingdom, I think, at the time, before Ed, Epcot opened, and then right. drive back in time to do the show. Um, but just a lot of laughs, just a lot of fun. And then there's a couple theaters that I really love. Um, there's a, a theater in Connecticut called The Seven Angels that's in. Uh, Waterbury, Connecticut, which is just a great little theater, is. which is a fun, uh, a fun gig. Um, yeah, and there were some one nighters. Used to be a club in Jersey called the Penny Arcade that I like to to work. Um, you know, a lot had to do with the fact that you had uh, 
you know, great club owners and guys who really appreciated yeah. what you did and and respected what you did and made you feel at home went out of their way to make you feel like, you know, they appreciated what you were doing. Yeah, um, yeah there was always – there's always been a, a handful of them, you know, and then there are, are places where, you know, you'd find out that the comics got to stay in the kitchen of the club. They had a little <laughs> room in the back that was a converted walk-in freezer. That was the uh, – you know, the vault that the comics got to, and I swear to God, you know, if you close the, the door, you would suffocate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed, I did a, I did a gig on the road and I had to stay in this woman's house who uh, ran the bar. Right. And she used to, so she, it was like an Airbnb situation, which before Airbnb or whatever. Right. And uh, no one told me though, that she was a, She's old as shit, but she was a crazy stoner. I mean, like too much weed, right? But I had no idea. So I go, I sleep there, I get downstairs the next morning. She's passed out on her kitchen table. And I was like, oh, God, she fucking died. Like, you know, I mean, that's just the comics attitude, too. Where I was like, I was like, now they're going to think I fucking did it. Like, <laughs> like, it was just pure annoyance at that point where I was like, really, really? She's. T- and after like, but I but I went over and I was kind of like checked her like poked her a little bit and she was just like woke up and accused me of stealing her weed and it was fun uh, and I was just like no I didn't uh, I'm like did you spend all night out here and she was like I guess <laughs> <laughs> and I was like all right well I'm going out because you know die. you have to have discipline if you're going to be the bartender at a comedy club yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly i was like oh my god what the hell but then some the, the owner of the club was like oh she smokes a lot of weed uh so she might do that i'm like cool just as long as i can get in later that's fine by me it's <laughs> always the fucking best man oh we had a picture of that i wanted to throw that picture up at the roast but i can't find it right now but that was uh you i'm impressed that you have like that many pictures of back in the day because it's hard to find like some some people I have on, and I'm like, do you have any evidence that you were performing? Well, part of it <laughs> is part of it is that Jackie Martling is is a you know almost like a historian. He has some detailed wow. um, copies, you know, of stuff uh, like the photo of Eddie and, and Martling and I um, on yeah. uh, on yeah, stage. That's- yeah, that's that's from Jackie. And uh, hang on, I'm going to email you the oh, the photo now because I'm prepared. <laughs> i will get it uh, um yeah that was that was a, an amazing um night the uh yeah it's a the phenomenal roast of photo Jerry like Kuno. everybody's um, there uh, well i guess uh, uh richie minervini knew uh cooney's brother and okay cooney was starting to be you know starting to make a name for himself uh, he was getting famous, right? And so Jackie thought, you know, why don't we get some publicity out of this? Why don't we do a roast? And um, so we did it. It was the first roast I think we ever did, and uh, you know, it was the I guess whoever was in town from the Magnificent Seven, the seven of us who started out together at Dixon's, and so I guess whoever was in town at the time to to be at the roast was there. Um, wasn't all of us, but it was uh, you know the core group, and we all wrote. You know all this roast stuff. London Lee, who was a one of the old time comics from the Ed Sullivan Show, I guess was doing the weekend at the East Side um, wow. that week, and so he was like the name on the show, and and Jerry was the you know the road, and ABC was there, and they had cameras, and we all knew we were all going to get sitcom there deals. Um, wow. Yeah, and it's London. It's it's Jerry at the podium there. You see, to the right is Martling. Yep. Uh, to uh, camera left is Minervini, and then to his left is London Lee. Wow. Um, then there's me in in my tuxedo from yeah. from uh, Grand awesome. Rapids, from Michigan. and then Bob <laughs> Nelson, and then Eddie, um, and then um, to the right of Martling is Jim Myers, and then there's um, Vince D'Antona and George. Oh my God! Um, I, wow, when I was a fucking year i would think a year in i worked with vince antonio and george is a great guy and then the, on the right is um the late great bob woods and the late great vince antonio actually because he's no longer with us 
Yeah. He he was scared the shit out of me, apparently. I don't know if he did that on purpose or if it was like a real thing. He really did he think George was real? Is that most ventriloquists? I think that most ventriloquists have this thing where they like to pretend that the, the dummy is real. Of course, don't ever say it's a dummy, but um <laughs> but it helps with the illusion. Yeah, yeah. Otto of Otto and George, and I always you know, to me it's always made me laugh that Otto was not the dummy's name; that it was it was the guy's name. Yeah, yeah. And George was the dummy, and um, <laughs> Otto and George. I used to uh, be the house MC at a club called the Rainy Night House in Belrose, Queens, mm -hmm. and uh, had Otto on the show. And uh, I, I I interviewed Martling and, and Minervini on my podcast this past week, and, oh, and nice. Martling told the story of of when and Martin Luther was on the show and Otto and George were on the show and Martin and I were sitting at the table right up front. It was like one of those clubs, really, really tiny. And then mm -hmm. the tables were all squeezed together. And it was like maybe a, a, a sheet of paper between the table and the stage from where Jackie and I were, were sitting mm -hmm. and Otto and George, I'd never seen Otto and George, but somebody said, you know, if you see him, if he's free, book him. So I book him <laughs> and um, he gets on stage and there's an Asian woman sitting right up front, right in front. And Jackie and I are, are like to the right of the stage from, from the stage where Otto was standing. And he just goes immediately. He goes, Chinks, I hate you fucking people. I hate you fucking people. I got one question. Are my shirts ready? And Jackie and I were like, oh, my God. Did he just say that? <laughs> you know what it is? That is about you people. You're not happy unless there's a monster chasing you. And was, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. He awesome. got off stage, and he went out. There was no dressing room. There was no green room. Right. It was the alley in the back. So he walked out into the alley in the back and he's talking to George. You know, you really blew that punchline. You really, you came in too soon. Yeah, well, you shouldn't have gone after that the, the Chinese chick. And it, he's talking <laughs> back and forth. Wow. And I thought that, you know, and, and to this day, I'm not really sure if that was because he wanted to preserve the illusion or whether he actually, you know, Right. There was something special there between he and this other entity on stage. It's the same fucking yeah. every ventriloquist I met, man, has that. I mean, it must be like a rule book or like something you can't break. And it's like a fight club thing because they yeah. all do that. <laughs> so it's just, so I'm always like, maybe it's, I don't know what fucking is going uh, on, but um, Otto, Otto was fearless. Yes. Fearless. I've never seen anybody as Especially fearless as he was. Especially one of the clubs I was working at, he, you know, if you hired him, I don't know if it was like that back then. But I guess because he had so much pull, like, you know, later in his career or whatever, uh, if you hired him for to do a show, he might leave in 20. He might do 40. But if he left it, he would. Uh, but you never knew you'd be on never stage knew. and you had to stay. I remember having to stay in the fucking room. Yeah. The prestige. Exactly. The prestige. Uh, yeah. I had to stay in the fucking room. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and if in case he would just go, oh, all right, that's it. And then and then you'd have to like run to wherever, wherever you were. If he'd even show up for the gig. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was only one other guy. I opened for Angel Salazar back in the day, and I had I had heard stories, you know, about him disappearing. Never experienced it. I've worked with him like before or whatever. Um, but I'm opening for him. And uh, do you ever do bananas in Jersey? Oh, sure. Okay. Do you know Denise, the manager there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay, good. So Denise, so you know how it's, you know tiny Denise, whatever. Right. We're about the same height anyway. But you know, so I'm on I'm on stage. I'm doing my dumb shit, right? And, uh, and so, uh, I know, you know, it's time and Otto's going to come up or whatever. So I got to get off or whatever. And Denise is on the side of the stage and she, uh, and she does, she does this and I've got more time, but I'm like, Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, I guess, uh, your headliner's ready. I'm going to get out of here. And she's going, Ow. she does this again. And I went, all right, Denise, I'm getting the fuck off. Relax. And she's like, no, 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 don't get off. She goes, stay there. This one. And I was like, <laughs> Like you, you want me to stretch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she's freaking out because they can't find Angel because he was, you know, backstage, whatever. And then uh doing or <laughs> I think he was in the kitchen doing coke or whatever. But um, but she couldn't figure out how to tell me to fucking stay on stage. And I was like, All right, Denise, get the fuck away from the stage. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus Christ. Um, but that was hilarious too, because that was also a night where I'm pretty sure she wound up saving my ass because uh Angel was like, hey, we're all, uh, me and my friends, we've got a limo. We're going to get into the car. And we're going to drive into the city. Do you want to come? And before I could say yes or no, she, like, grabbed my arm. And she was like, he's good. And then, like, <laughs> she dragged me she back. She goes, life. yeah, she goes, you go with him and you will never come back. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, really? All right. Thanks. Yeah, it's good, it's good to have protectors. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's always that's one of the clubs that I like doing, and and uh, she was yeah, always bananas was always a lot of fun. Yeah, just a great room. Harlan and Arlene were always amazing people. I know. Um, right. She used to wear the most uncomfortable shoes. I could never figure out. She would have these tiny feet, but then she would wear these fucking wedges that were like yes, yes, you know, and yeah. And I, and still, even when, even when, you know, I mean, when I was, when I started there, she was older at the time. And I was like, are your ankles just going to snap off one day? And we're all going to have to run like, what is going on? And then, uh, uh, but she would always do this thing where she would go, don't, don't easy on the fucks. And then I, I, I would just be like, okay. And like, she would never watch the fucking show. No, so it right. didn't matter at all, but always do it. And yeah. then after a while I was like, you know me by now, do you know, I'm not like, do you, are you just going to, do you just say that? It's like a pre-show ritual, and she would just be like, "You don't do it, do you?" And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like she doesn't. "I'm using it as my middle name." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh my god, fuck. Well, dude, I it's been uh, it's been an hour and twelve minutes. I don't want to keep you any longer than uh, I said I was going I to. I got nowhere to go. Then let's fucking stay. Let's, let's stay. just let's hold each other. Do you have what some, do you? You have some person who needs to get on this this. Network? No, you guys, you guys, are, no, you guys are good to run. But I actually do have to go uh, be in Mendrino's comedy therapy show in a little bit. So, I, oh, you know, I, so this is this is always what happens, right? <laughs> the artists are yeah. willing to continue to work, but well, the fucking union guy, you know, <laughs> pushing the fucking buttons, he's got a commitment. So, what are you, what are you going to do for Mendrino's? You're going to fuck up his audio too? What are you going to do? <laughs> What are you going to do over at Mandrinos? That's you know what's funny? Is, I'm actually a judge in their comedy contest. Why don't you gentlemen? Oh, yeah, because, I because you, know, you know comedy so well. <laughs> <laughs> That's why our careers are always constantly <laughs> fucked. They do do that to us. <laughs> They're like, hey, we got the mailman. Uh, this guy's I don't mailman. even know how I made it. I'm not going to lie. Oh. We, we, we have <laughs> Suffolk County's funniest dentist on the show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, right the audacity it's not even other comedians who've been in it longer than you it's just whoever they can grab you know i mean uh, ted kaczynski and i are cooking where we have this little thing going back and forth and then you know all of a sudden marvin from the booth decides that he's gonna just you know <laughs> kiss in the punch bowl it's every fucking club owner who doesn't know a thing about comedy but wants it you know i'm like stay in the fucking kitchen let us do the show yeah i mean i'm i'm getting the light from the fucking AV squad. I mean, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that great when you get the light uh, from somebody you know doesn't matter and you're like, oh, now I'm never fucking getting off. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You're like, fuck <laughs> you. I wanted to leave because I hate this room, but now I'm staying. Here's the greatest feeling. You're on stage at Catch. You're mm -hmm. cooking. You're really... And then Robin Williams pokes his head in the room and, you know, 200 heads go turn and see him. <laughs> And then, and then, and then it's over. And it's oh. like, you can't, you can't do anything at that point. And then he goes on and then the, the Columbus says, well, you can go back, you know, when he's done. And, <laughs> and he does two and a half hours. Oh, fuck. You want to sit in a warm tub? You want to sit in a warm tub and, and open he, a vein? Did you get to hang out with him or anything like that? I only met him once. I met Which him. I could have met um, uh, he was an inspiration too uh, when I mm -hmm. first started because I, actually I thought that being a stand-up was the easiest way of becoming an actor because Steve Martin, Robin Williams, all these guys yeah. who started as stand-ups were getting these these acting gigs with it. That was like the shortest way. It was like a shortcut to, to being an actor. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a uh, – uh, they do a, a couple of shows. They do two shows a year on Broadway for Equity Fights AIDS. One used to be called the Gypsy of the Year – um awards um which was based on the dancers uh called gypsies because they would go from you know show to show in town to town they would give out some kind of an award to whoever was the oldest living gypsy on broadway at the time but all the shows do sketches do little sketches right um and uh, and then they have the easter bonnet competition easter to one they coincide with the uh, the holidays because what happens is the shows after the curtain call, we'll get up on stage and talk about equity fights AIDS and ask for donations and they have the little red buckets. And, and this is the culmination when they find out how much money they've raised. And it's just, it's a great event. There's all this, you know, and so I was, it was a year I wasn't in a show. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, I had done I'd done a sketch, wrote a sketch when I was in Little Shop. Um, it was the actor's studio interviewing the plant. Um, and I, and I played, you know, the actor studio guy yeah, you know, yeah. with a stack of, you know, uh, index cards like this tall. <laughs> Audrey two. What is your favorite curse word? You know? <laughs> um, and then I did something that Dan Radcliffe wrote a, a song parody that we did, uh, some of the tune of anything goes, it was about calling in sick, um, to, to a show. And there's this whole dance number. And I was on, um, I was on crutches or I was bandaged up, whatever it was. And, um, but I was in full Broadway dance, um, you know, company head, you know, the little sweatband and the right. horn sweatshirt, whatever. And then I, I pretended I had a heart attack at the end of the, the number, um, <laughs> and which I didn't tell the rest of the cast. So that was kind of a, oh my God. kind of a fun, they had to drag me off the stage. This, oh, would yeah. be this thing? No, no, that's, that's the Macy's Thanksgiving day parade. Oh, okay. Okay. We, we did brotherhood of man. Um, um, anyway, so, uh, I was, it was a year I was not working in a show and I was, Ah. uh, one of the hosts, one of the segments, I think I was to introduce the judges or whatever. And Christy Brinkley and John Leguizamo, um, John Leguizamo and I were introducing the, the, the judges and, um, Robin Williams and Harvey Feinstein. Firestein, Harvey Firestein, mm-hmm. and and Christy Brinkley, and uh, there's a great picture. I, I probably should have sent that to you, uh, where Robin Williams wow. was. He, Robin Williams had done a show on Broadway that year. And, wow! Um, oh I got, yeah, I got to meet him. yeah. It was um Tiger something Tiger, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. The ba- oh fuck, I can't remember the name. Yeah. But I wanted to see that, I didn't get to. It was something Tiger, but was, I actually got to you know meet him, you know, face to face. That's incredible. You know, at that point, which yeah. was kind of cool, but it's a great picture of me and Lou Grisamo and Harvey Firestein and Christy Prickley and Robin Williams and me. You know, it's like <laughs> one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> oh my god, that's that's incredible. So that's another thing too. Is like your class when you came up, you had Jackie and Eddie, mm-hmm. and then who? And then what? So Paul Reiser was in your class then too, I guess. Yeah, and Paul, Seinfeld Paul, and those guys. Yeah. Paul, um, Paul Larry Miller. Paul, Larry Miller, those guys, they were, they were like a, maybe a year ahead of me Okay. on, on, on the, on the thing. Um, but on Long Island, it was, it was Martling, it was Eddie, it was Bobby Nelson, mm-hmm. uh, Bob Woods, Dave Hawthorne, um, you know, Fred Stoller was one of the city yeah. guys, uh, Ron Richards, an oh, wow. incredibly funny guy, he used to write for Letterman, mm-hmm. uh, Rich Hall, another great writer, wow. um, Carol Leifer, um, Joe Bolster. Oh, Mark no way. Schiff. Yeah. Mark I met Schiff. I met him at the comedy and magic club. Yeah, Joe Bolster is a funny guy. He won he won the uh, Showtime Big Laugh Off that I was in. I came in second to Joe. Oh and, wow. um, and uh, he he's never he's never let me forget it. Uh, <laughs> I saw him at uh, a funeral, Alan Combs funeral, actually. Unfortunately, oh, okay. um, we knew Alan. I can't believe that guy was a stand-up. stand-up. Yeah, he was a funny ass stand-up too. He was a DJ. He, he oh. used to be a DJ, and uh, he used to do this routine about being a DJ and breaking up with a girl while he was on the air. Oh my god! It was such a great. I'm not, I'm not going to do it justice, but it's like I can't believe that you're going to do. I can't believe you would do this to me. I can't believe you do that. That was Madonna with Black like Virgin. Uh, we'll back <laughs> this message. Uh, I want my records back. I want my fucking records back. Hey, uh, everybody! It's a quarter to the uh, hour, and uh, <laughs> just a great routine. Holy shit! I only know him as the guy who was on with Hannity when I was a kid. That was yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah That's was crazy, funny, man. Funny man. Yeah, and it's sweet. Could not be sweeter. Wow, sweeter. I, I, I've been lucky. I've, I've come across very few assholes. Um, in, in I feel the, the same. You know, um, I mean, the ones that that are assholes make up for the fact that there aren't many of them. But yeah, yeah, I've been very fortunate. Yeah, it's weird, man. I feel the same way. I feel kind of, uh, you know, fortunate to uh, to have met so many nice people when I was coming up and stuff like that. Especially like you said before, uh, it helps if you can drive when everybody else has a DUI, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> when you're younger, nice car. Yeah. Yes. That's what happened to me in Oaks. Oaks can't drive. And uh, I got taken out of the clubs thankfully early. Cause he was like, Hey, you want to go on the road? And I was like, yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, it. absolutely. And then I filled my car with diesel and he, and he forgave me. <laughs> uh, we had to get a tow ride back at three o'clock in the morning. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to be backstage. Keep going. 
and then just give me give me a thumbs oh, yeah. up when you're ready to go. Yeah, fuck you. Yeah. Really? He just don't leaves. do us any favors. Okay? I gotta go do uh, Madrinos and go. <laughs> I'll He's see crazy. you guys. I love, that, I love that you talk about doing sacrificing to be with your family, and he's not even leaving to go be with his wife. He's like, no, I gotta, no. I gotta got another gig, guys. Do. Yeah, he's better, he's better <laughs> dealing us for a guy who's fatter than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! I, oh, it's well. always a pleasure, Rob. Who are you so judging, by the way? I want to know who these comics are. Two brand new comics, They're actually very funny. Je- Jessica Miranda and mm-hmm. Amanda Cassis. I would I love you guys to the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Holy fuck! What? That's how we end it. It just cuts. <laughs> it cuts the black. <laughs> <laughs> we should pop in. If Matt, you guys would like to come, I'll send you the link. He's welcome nah, to join me. I'm all right. You, you're on your own. Tell no. them we didn't want to go. I'll tell them. <laughs> tell them these two legends that need it. Tell them that no one in that room is big enough for either one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you guys in a little oh, bit. Oh, God. Enjoy. Yeah, see thanks, Sparky. <laughs> Dad's gone. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this Let's is go. when you start undressing. Let's get out the I start taking my shirt off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, fuck. That's cool though, dude. I mean, are, so are you going to go back out and do stand up again? I think so. I mean, I think Good. there's going to be a pent up demand for it for sure. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to look like. You know, oh, hot I, garbage I think, immediately right off I the bat. Think, I'm not even so sure it's going to go come go back to where it was. I think there. Oh. It has been so long and, and things are so different. I think that stuff like this may wind up being more a part of the future than we realize. I think you know. Um, I think at least for interviews, right? Because I feel like even ce- like celebrities don't want to leave their fucking mansions. You know what I mean? To go to yeah, I mean, to no, go nobody, anywhere. You know, nobody wants to take the chance. I mean, I got my second shot, but I'm I'm not all that anxious to get on a plane yet. No, oh, you got the you second know. one. Yeah, yeah. How'd it go? Did it did it knock you for a loop? I got you know I got achy. Uh, I ran a low grade fever and my dick turned green. I don't know why that. I never read anything <laughs> about that being one of the side effects, but. Uh, <laughs> And suddenly got a better Wi-Fi, right? Yeah, all of a sudden. Yeah. So I get my first shot on Saturday. Okay. And I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to tell half the people I know because I really enjoy not seeing some of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there's also – there's a reason why some people should wear masks, and COVID is not usually one of the things. So I'm not looking forward to the fact when they're going to be taking them off. Yeah, I was exactly. kind of enjoying being spared, you know, some of yeah. the – Everybody's a lot fucking quieter too in grocery stores and shit. There's a lot oh, yeah. less. Oh yeah. Uh, no one's talking to me in line. It's amazing. Mm. I love all that shit. Mm. Um. So what you were on that you were talking about earlier? You were talking about seeing Riser and stuff like that. Were those guys monsters back in the day in the clubs? Like, what was that scene like? No, it was. I mean, everybody. Everybody was a fan of everybody else. Is the best way I could explain oh. it. One of the weeks I was in Fort Lauderdale, it was Seinfeld, Riser, myself, Ron Richards, I think Eddie. Um, it, you know, it's like a ridiculous show. Yeah, you know Dennis Wolfberg. And, oh um, wow! Um, you know, dearest, sweetest man on the fucking planet, and funny as all hell. Wow. Yeah, he he was hilarious. I've only ever seen his stuff. I've never he met him or seen him live. Great. Ugh. He was just a doll, just a dear, sweet man. I, I miss him every day. Um, right. And you know, after the show was over. You know, Riser would get on the piano, and uh, like Larry Miller would say, he got he had, would get a, the they had a little band like they used to have at Cash. To I never knew that. The show, and uh, Riser got on the piano, and and uh, Larry Miller played guitar, and I think I don't think Seinfeld played anything, but and right. I played drums, and so I would sit on the drums, and we would just jam after the show. Holy you shit! Know? And then it was funny because I I drove Paul got um, diner wh- while we were in. Florida together when we were at the Fort Lauderdale comic strip. He had said he got it on this audition and then he, you know, he thought he might get a call back and he got a call. He got the part and he had a flight to Baltimore the next day. And so I wow. drove him to the airport. Um, and, um, he was sending me letters from, from the set, you know, mm-hmm. and he said that he and Kevin Bacon and, uh, and, um, a couple of the other guys, uh, I don't know if Mickey Rourke was one of them, but a couple of the other guys from the movie, um, they would all jam together. They would all, wow. you know, they, they, you know, Kevin Bacon played the guitar, obviously, and Paul played the um, piano, and 
and uh, everyone kind of bonded around the Beatles because that's what we did. You know, we bonded around the Beatles. So. Right. Um, and Barry Sonnefeld, he was the one who came in and felt like people like that back in the day used to come into the comedy clubs to actually find talent, right? It wasn't Barry Sonnefeld. It was Barry. It wasn't. What the hell's his name? It's another Barry. Yeah, yeah I think. You're, uh, did I fuck it up? Maybe who the hell was it then? It was. Um, um, I'll tell you right now. That's weird. Uh, uh, Barry Levinson. Barry Levinson. Yeah, Fuck Barry right. Levinson, that, yeah. I fucked it up. I messed up. The yeah, name. they they were. They, they, those were the days when yeah, because all of a sudden they realized that these comedians, um, surprise surprise, they could act. You yeah, know, they 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 couldn't, and I think you know Rodney doing Caddyshack was was one of the better, um, better examples of that. You know, when were, right? Whoever made the really wise decision to cast him in that movie, but wasn't and he on set like going like, "Hey, I'm bombing," because nobody he didn't understand. Oh yeah, he didn't really understand why he wasn't getting any laughs. It was like they can't laugh. It's a movie. We have right. the microphones. He he. Uh, after Caddyshack came out, he was huge. I guess he lived like in Boca or someplace near the strip. Right. And he used to come in to try out material before he did Carson. And he came in one night, Eddie and I were on, on the show mm -hmm. and um, he, uh, you know, Dangerfield did a set and then Eddie, Eddie went up and says, run, you run, you got to see me act. You got to see me act. And Ronnie says, yeah, okay, kid. Okay. And you know, Eddie goes up and does his act. And this is, you know, I think this was just before Eddie got the audition for SNL. Right. And, um, uh, Eddie does his routine and, and, and gets off stage. He goes, what do you think? Ronnie goes, uh, kid, you're funny, but uh, where are you going to go with it? So, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the great understatements of all time. Right. But what, what struck me was Rodney went through his entire set line by line in the, in the bar in a table with me asking me what I thought of each line. Wow. And I'm like, Rodney Dangerfield is asking me? Right. You know, it's just, but that's, that's the way he was. I mean, he was like, he knew, you know, that we we all kind of shared this little commonality together and he trusted other comics to tell them what they, you know, the honest truth about what they thought about lines. Yeah. That's the other thing I was talking to somebody that, you know, Jessica Kirsten. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Jess about uh, just um, like, I, I think she had said something about um, Ellen not having any standups on her show. Just mm -hmm. something about how that's uh, kind of odd or whatever. And I was like, it's so weird that that generation who got helped out by the generation before them, like Rodney helped out a shit ton of comics. Oh yeah, but the ones that came after that, I feel like just fucking did not pay that forward at all. Like in the we, you know, like yeah, um, no, I mean, you know, Jeff Foxworthy paid it forward. Oh, he did. I, okay, yeah, I, I, uh, I got Jeff into New York, and, and mm -hmm. um, um, also, uh, I mean. I could be I, wrong. I was, right? I was his best man at his wedding in, in Central Park. His second oh, nice. wedding. And, um, and my wife was the maid of honor for his wife. And she was 18 months pregnant with our first child. Um, <laughs> and and uh, Vic Henley, I think, is the greatest example oh. of somebody who paid it forward. Vic was. He's the best. Vic was one of the greatest people on the planet. Yep. I mean, I just, and nice, I, nice man. I loved him like a brother. And we had more fun together on the road. And I brought him to New York. As yeah. well, and and he uh, he never forgot. As a matter of fact, I spoke to him. This is so fucking weird. The night before he died, uh, right. he called me out of the blue. Robbie, how you doing? Just want to check in on you. And, uh, he, <laughs> he, was, he was he was a little. He was. I think he'd been in the tequila. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, he was feeling. His favorite. He was feeling, I just want to tell you, man. I just I, I tell everybody how much I owe to you. I owe, I owe this to you. You get me here. Just it was like it's just so weird. It's like, but you, and Jeff, and Jeff Foxworthy will tell you. You know, you know he's he went on further than I did. He'll tell you that you were worth it, Vic. You know, right. you had, matter of fact, in many ways, I thought Vic was funnier than Jeff. I thought Vic was a better storyteller, and Vic had better material than Jeff. And yeah, and he certainly was was the salt of the earth. You know, when it came to yeah. people, and, and um, and he he did. I did at his memorial. Everyone told stories about how he went to bat for them. You know, at the strip or on the road or whatever, and it's—I mean, because you know we're we're all in this together, really. I mean, yeah. it, it's competitive, but you know, there's a certain bond you have with yes. people who who you know, it's we're in the trenches together. You know, yeah. it's like it's the same. I would imagine it's the same kind of camaraderie and and friendship and brotherhood that you have when you're in the military and you're in, yeah. You know, well, you're it's like you're all on the same somebody. rowboat. You're just yeah. everybody's at a different point in the boat. You're all yeah. rowing, but you yeah. know, you're just so many people. Some of the people are getting lunch sooner than others. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
It's crazy. Vic was Vic was super nice to me when I started out, and then I hadn't seen him in a few years. And I don't know why. Like I, I was back when I was like I, I, I like to get pictures of me with other comics. Now, like when you work with people, just to have it, like you have all those photos and stuff. And when I first met him, I never did it, and I thought he was hilarious, and I know he was open for Kathleen Madigan and stuff. Second or third, like I saw him a couple other times, never did it. One of the last times was like th- like three years before he died. We were at Gotham together. And we hadn't seen each other in a long time. And we were just like, oh, my God, what's going on? I think I was, like, living in L.A. too at the time. But I just come back or whatever. And uh, I was like, hey, I'm like, I hate doing this. But would you? And I took my phone. He's like, you want to get a photo? <laughs> I was like, yes. And it was like, yeah, we just took a picture together. And, yeah. and he was just the sweetest, sweetest fucking dude ever. Yeah, and I we just him. sat in the back of the room. We had uh, Seinfeld that popped in. Uh-huh. uh-huh. And we were, we were all just crowded in the back fucking watching yeah. him crush. And, yeah. you know. I was I was doing Gotham one weekend. And, and uh Vic was uh, just hanging out because I guess he had been there during the week and Seinfeld mm-hmm. came in to, to try out some stuff. Um, and it, that, that was the thing about Vic. I mean, you could not see him for years. Right. And then you'd bump into him and it's like you just saw him the night before. <gasps> I mean, it was wow. just you picked right up where you left off, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he was a, he was a very cool dude. Every Like you said before, though, too, like everybody that I've met, I guess the same thing happened for you too. Is like, I miss these people. I miss seeing them. You don't get to see them too much when you're all headlining no. different clubs. Cause no. you don't yeah. get to hang out. But when you do, that's like that charity event though. Like that was fucking, yeah. I mean, just seeing everybody for yeah. all, I mean, we were all, we were, I don't know how you kept popping back in when you did, because we were fucking exhausted. And then it seemed like you weren't sleeping either. I don't even know if no. you got any sleep. No, no. no. <laughs> Nobody sleeps. <laughs> sleeping yeah. we're like holy shit is right i remember like being in the room and we'd be like what if rob's still up like hey he's still there be, like three o'clock in the morning that was, that was a lot of great. fun was a lot yeah of fun. i had a lot of fun doing that and, and a lot of fun meeting some of you guys who i'd never really met before you know that was yeah. kind of cool and and uh and and being kind of inspired and and relieved that you actually were funny you yeah know? <laughs> I I totally understand that, and I know that I can tell when people are like, "Oh God, I, I like him, but I hope he's funny." Yeah, that's why exactly. I was glad we did that stand up show together. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, at least it's fucking off the table now." Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I like him, but I don't know if he's funny. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> that was Crazy. a fun show, though. It was a lot of fun. It yeah, was I was surprised. Fun. I didn't want to do it. I didn't like. Have you done a lot of the Zoom stand up? No, I haven't. That was the first and only, actually. And yeah, but but Matt, you know, because Matt's charity was so oh yeah, he's incredible. Great... Yes, and you know, I could how could I not? You know, I just thought that that was yeah. You know, that was my fourth Zoom show, and I didn't know I was doing stand up on it. I I I like you know comedians half paying attention to an email, so I get the email, and I just thought it was like oh cool, the guy who donated the most. Mm-hmm. wants us all to come back on to mm-hmm. talk about shit or whatever. And mm-hmm. then I was talking to Tom and I'm like, yeah, man, like, but it out. He's like, Oh, you got to go. You got a set to do. And I was like, Oh, I'm not doing a set. And he was just like, mm, I think you're doing, <laughs> I think you're doing time. And I literally like, I felt so bad because I was, I was like, fuck. <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I hate this shit. I'm like, I don't want to do it. Like, but and that's like my whole build up to that was, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And then they were like, you're on. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> juggling you know whatever turn, I turn the switch on that's yep, it exactly every every step of the way though was like i hope my fucking power goes out these mother <laughs> just didn't want to do zoom <laughs> <laughs> zoom comedy man yeah that's the bad part that's yeah, the bad exactly. part well, i want to do a, a roast uh i want to do a, a roast for uh for a charity i want to help out another comic um, yeah. who, who could use the help. And so I, I think uh, I want to put together a roast. I think Richie and, and Mark said something about being able to use this as a, as a place that we could actually do it. And I, de- I definitely want you on the show. I think Thank you'd you. Be, I think you'd be a great addition. And also, do you, do you, do you act at all? Do you have any interest in acting or? I do have an interest in acting and I, I've, I've, uh, I have a short film on uh, Amazon prime right now called Dup yeah. It. Okay. that I wrote and uh, star in and it's uh, send me the link so I can see it. I will. Um, and I have, I have something that you might be interested in. We'll talk about it off the air. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Something I think it'd be really perfect for. So, Oh, thank you. Yeah. That'd be, I, if, we, if we get to work together, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I'm already in. All right. <laughs> well, I gotta go. I gotta, I got a gig um, in, in June. So I gotta, <laughs> 
<laughs> all right, cool, man. Um, yeah, no, that was this has been great, dude. We we went longer than I normally go, so that well, was um anytime. Enjoy. It's yeah. always a pleasure. Um, Absolutely. You're 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 a funny man. You're a great host, and uh, thank you. And a halfway decent human being. So what more could you ask for? <laughs> the trifecta. Got it. <laughs> Just. You know, just try to channel these these evil thoughts that you have and this violence that, that mm -hmm. you are embracing. You know, you don't have to listen to everything the dog tells you. <laughs> okay? So just keep that in mind, you know, as you continue to write your manifesto, mm -hmm. that sometimes the dog doesn't know what he's talking about. All right? I'll right. just say that. I'll um, Yes, you're right. I'll forward all. <laughs> I'll forward all his messages to you. He yes. texts me now. That's oh, okay. The that's good. That's good. I never. Right. Yeah, that's good. Which is can, which is a lot because you know the the nails sometimes you know the, the claws. It's it's rough, man. Yeah. It's good. I can put them on mute, so at least that helps a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Thanks so much, Tom. My says pleasure. thank you again from the room. He's judging comedy and, now. And, and tell Tom. Um, sincerely, I mean, I, I joke, mm. and I, you know, I break, I break balls, and Richie, you know, of course, Richie yeah. burns them. But I, you know, and I, I mean it sincerely. When I say, Tom, go fuck yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, cool, man. All right, Thanks John, again. good to see you. Thank yeah, you. Good to see you too, man. Peace and uh, check out the uh, Rob Butler Radio Comedy Hour because I oh. interview Minervini and and Martling about the early days of Long Island comedy. So oh, sweet dude, absolutely. I'll make great, sure I plug that. It's a great. Uh, it's a. It's a. Kind of a, a you know a walk down memory lane and some some funny funny stories. Literally. Sweet man. All right, it's been great. Let's do this again. Yeah, Soon. absolutely. Well, we got to have a round two. Anytime, care, anytime. Peace. All right, John. Bye. Dystopia tonight.